Bristol Transitional Town Hall. For those of you who do not know me, I am Dr. Bandy Lee, forensic psychiatrist, violence expert, and president of the World Mental Health Coalition. Uh, my co-hosts today are Leonard and Mark, and please be advised that this session is being recorded. We now have less than 65 hours left of this presidency, which we are eager to see end, even as we're bracing ourselves to the last hour, since the remaining days are still the most dangerous. This is without mentioning the ongoing crises where more than 4,000 Americans are dying per day from COVID-19, and we will very soon reach a half million deaths, the vast majority of which were unnecessary. Hospitals are overwhelmed and the level of loss, economic hardship, misery and mental health issues our nation is about to face is unfathomable. Then there is the fact that we are perilously close to wars, especially with Iran, to nuclear disaster because of the renewed arms race and to climate catastrophe because of the worst environmental policies in this nation's history. Not unrelatedly, for the remaining days of this presidency, Donald Trump meets the criteria for psychiatric hospitalization for danger to others and to the nation after his recent incitement of violent insurrection. But it is out of our hands now. We did our best to raise alarms, to notify lawmakers and even the Secret Service and the Capitol Police with the hope that they will do their jobs. Today, we have gathered to look ahead as we shift our focus from Donald Trump's immediate dangers to future plans that would help us uh, to ensure protection from such a destructive presidency. Um, the World Mental Health Coalition formed with the mission to heal and strengthen societal mental health. And today's town hall is an open forum that includes coalition members, as well as members of the public, and we would like to hear from all of you. We would like to propose questions such as, what exactly happened over these last four years? How can we begin to heal? What can we do to protect society against future dangerous leaders? And what would you like to see? from our planned Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We have our own ideas, uh, but we would like to hear from you today as to what is needed for the moment and into the future. Congress members themselves probably do not have the words to put to their experiences of the recent trauma. Representative Jamie Raskin is one of the champions of our work, a truly good and thoughtful leader to whom we sent condolences recently as a group because of his recent loss. We would like to show a six minute clip of him from today. Um, Leonard, would you show the video please? I, I want to uh, turn now to a different subject um, because I think it's a lot of people watching know how remarkable it is uh, that you have the energy and, and to do what you're doing, um, given the fact that you're dealing with a family tragedy. You lost your son, 25-year-old you know, Tommy, uh, to depression. You wrote a very moving reflection on his, quote, perfect heart, a perfect soul, a riotously outrageous and relentless sense of humor, and a dazzlingly, dazzling radiant mind. Um, my, my wife, Sarah, and I wrote this together. Um, tell, tell us more about, about Tommy. Um, well, uh, Tommy was a remarkable person. Um, he had overwhelming love for humanity and for our country uh, in his heart and really for all the people of the world. Uh, we lost him on the very last day of that god-awful year, 2020, um, and he left us a note um, which said, please forgive me, uh, my illness won today. Look after each other, the animals and the global poor for me, all my love, Tommy. Um, and that was the last act in 
a life that uh, dazzled um, anybody who came into uh, contact with Tommy. He was uh, a slam poet who wrote these magnificent 20, 30 minute poems, which he of course knew by heart, uh, and he would get up and perform them. Um, he was absolutely devoted to human rights for every person. He was devoted to animal rights and welfare. He was a passionate vegan and convinced a lot of people to stop eating animals mm -hmm. just through the force of his poetry. Uh, he was a, a second year student at Harvard Law School. I mean, he was uh, a beautiful kid. When we lost him, he had um, not only beloved friends at Harvard Law School, but he was teaching uh, a course with Michael Sandel, Justice, uh, as a teaching fellow uh, at the college. And so he had students of his own, and uh, he graded all of his papers and exams and wrote many pages analyzing the work of the students and writing back to them. And he made donations in each of their names to different charitable groups that he thought would be consistent with the values of the student. And so some of them went to uh, give directly or to Oxfam or so on. And um, uh, I asked him why he did that. And he quoted um, something that Father Berrigan had said about the great Dorothy Day. He said, uh, well, like Father Berrigan said about Dorothy Day, she lived as though the truth were true. And he said, I want to show them um, that the truth is true and we can live that way. So, um, you know, people are asking me uh, why I decided to do this. First of all, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to say no to Speaker Pelosi about anything, uh, but she's actually been very sensitive and thoughtful. But um, she wanted me to do it because she knows that I've devoted my life to the Constitution and to the Republic. I'm a professor of constitutional law. Um, but I did it really uh, with my son in my heart uh, and helping lead the way. I feel him in my chest. Um, when we went to count the Electoral College votes and it came under that ludicrous attack, um, I felt my son with me uh, and I was most concerned with uh, our youngest daughter and my son-in-law, who's married to our other daughter, who were with me that day, who got caught in a room off of the house floor and between them and me was a rampaging armed mob that could have killed them easily and was banging on the doors where they were hiding under a desk with my chief of staff, Julie Tagan. These events are personal to me, Jake. There was an attack on our country. There was an attack on our people. There are thousands of people who work on Capitol Hill, not just members, but staff members and Capitol Hill police officers who were pushed and shoved and punched in the face, pummeled and hit over the head with fire extinguishers. And the President of the United States did nothing to stop it for more than two hours as members of Congress were calling him and begging him to do something. And he continued to watch it on TV and to enjoy their, you know, insurrection tailgate party where they were celebrating the attack on our democracy. This president has been impeached already twice and we just want the Senate to conduct a serious trial where every member of the Senate lives up to his or her constitutional oath to render impartial yeah. judgment as a juror. Congressman, I, I mean, I, I, I can't even begin to express my condolences for what you and your wife and, and your daughters and, and family are, are, are dealing with. I can't also imagine having that trauma compounded with this other trauma. You, you just lost your son and now you're in Congress worrying about your daughter and your other daughter's husband because of these terrorists who had attacked the Congress. That trauma on top of trauma I, just seems so debilitating. To well, me. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to lose my son at the end of 2020 and lose my country and my republic in 2021. It's not going to happen. Um, and um, the vast majority of the American people, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, reject armed insurrection and violence as a new way of doing business in America. We're, we're not going to do that. This was the most terrible crime ever by a president of the United States against our country. And I want everybody to feel the gravity and the solemnity of those events at the same time, of course, that all of us are deeply invested in President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris moving the country forward to repair all of the wreckage and the damage of last year. 
on everything from COVID-19 to the economy. But I was thinking on the way over this morning, Jake, about the preamble to the Constitution. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, do hereby ordain and establish. We have to do all of those things at the same time. We have to establish justice. We have to ensure domestic tranquility. At the same time, we are promoting the general welfare. But mm -hmm. this is America, and the people are up to it. And we've got uh, a new administration coming to town that is ready to lead America back on the road of progress. Thank you. Those were very moving words uh, by a very principled and thoughtful representative. Um, I'd like to repeat his words. I'm not going to lose my son at the end of 2020 and lose my country and my republic in 2021. All this was preventable and, uh, and had been predicted so that they would be preventable. So our question is, how can we do our part not to lose our country and our republic? So I'd like to repeat the questions to you that we'll be asking today. What happened? How can we heal? How can we educate lawmakers and the public so as to prevent these untoward events? How can we help screen against dangerous personalities? And what can we do to bring truth to the fore and to reconcile with it? So I'd like to turn over these questions to you, the audience, coalition members, and uh, members of the public, um, to ask your question or to make your suggestions. You can, um, uh, sorry, you can um, go to the bottom of your screen, Click on participants and you will have the option to raise your hand to your right. Once your name is called, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. Great, our first question will come from, uh, it's I think Ellen, E-L-E-N, if you can please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to just thank you profoundly for the information you're trying to bring to light. Um, I think that while we are seeing so much um, asking um, public health experts and epidemiologists for their insights right now, yet with um, the mental health community, you've been struggling so much to just be listened to and be heard while, so just thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask if anyone is aware of or working on the um, instance of uh, Aaron Coleman, a um, very young progressive um, who was recently elected to the Kansas State Legislature. Um, that can be an instance of perhaps preventing a pathology from getting close to the levers of power before we've gotten to this point. I'm going to post a couple articles about him, but um, he's, there's currently an investigation to see if he is fit to serve. And um, his personality seems clearly abusive. And I'm not sure if there are mental health professionals as part of this investigation. So I just wanted, wanted to, share, to share about that and express my profound gratitude. Yes, thank you very much. Um, would you like to explain a little bit about Aaron Coleman's situation? I've heard a little bit, but uh, I don't know the details. Yeah, Ellen, unmute your microphone again. Okay, I just sent, um, put one article in the, ch in the chat. Um, let's see, it's hard to, um, 
I'm just, you know, a, a lay person. I've been learning a lot about abuse and narcissistic abuse lately. And um, just the, the specifics of the things he's been accused of. One is um, putting his hands on a girl's neck. Another is threatening um, nude pictures of a very young girl. Um, other things he's done is if people get up, if people don't want to do what he wants, including in his text threads, he immediately gets threatening. He threatened like an aide of one of his political opponents. And his communication is so clearly gaslighting. He will issue these like incredibly dismissive apologies. And some people, because he has, you know, he has policies that are very different from Trump. And some people are excusing him. Some are saying, well, he needs to be, you know, groomed to be less impolite. But um, he's made he's made violent threats. He's just a consistent, and he's only twenty. <laughs> so it's so clear to me, um, and I'm sure it will be very very clear to you. And okay, I think we lost the sound. Yeah, not sure, um, Bandia. I would, yeah, um, feel free. Okay. To, to uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I've been hearing things about uh, Aaron Coleman, who is a uh, um, representative in, in a regional district. And so uh, what to do when we have elected officials who are behaving inappropriately in ways that would disqualify him or her, usually a him, uh, from any other job. We have this difficulty of elected officials not being subject to the same kind of screening and scrutiny, especially uh, psychological fitness uh, testing, as ordinary jobs are increasingly doing. Um, all military personnel, law enforcement personnel, uh, now increasingly CEOs, even doctors and lawyer groups have increasingly instituted mental fitness tests, but elected officials are not subject to them because the constitution does, uh, I, I guess I hear that they prevent uh, any uh, disqualifying measures from being instituted. But what do we do when we know that certain psychological conditions could show in um, a, a scholar of psychopathy's words, a mask of it, mask of sanity. And what we do when a larger portion of the population is increasingly attracted to such aggressive um, antisocial tendencies, simply because it validates and, and gives permission to their own. So these are dilemmas that we currently face that um, we will have to address in the coming, coming weeks and months, quite apparently. Okay, so next question, please. Our next question will come from Marion Douglas Ungaro. Uh, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody, Professor Lee and all. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the only Black American on, uh, in the event this evening. Uh, my family was created in what is now the United States and enslaved here. Those processes were directly connected. The, the creation, the human breeding that nobody talks about and the slavery that, that folks mention, but only as something in the past, not in terms of the fact that an entire population was created. But I am hearing uh, that there's basically going to be a cover up. I have not heard, I, I spoke about this uh, several weeks ago on a previous, one of your previous sessions, Dr. Lee, that none of this is new in the United States. This is the entire history of the American South since 1866, the Asheville election riot. They called them riots but basically they were basically like pogroms against the local black American communities, basically in every Southern state, as soon as black men were able to vote. And so local governments, the, the um, most egregious situation was uh, the local coup in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, 
I just, um, I was actually composing a message to the whole group about David Zucchino's book, which just came out a year ago, January of 2020, um, The Wilmington's Lie, because we're, we're lying about American history. Things happen with my family in South Carolina and elsewhere, and finding out what really happened. Black Americans were driven out of communities. They were murdered, they were raped, their property was stolen, and they were not able to vote until the 1960s when Fannie Lou Hamer drew attention to this and Lyndon Johnson shut her up. So I am concerned as a journalist, uh, television and radio journalist and having worked in international human rights missions in Srebrenica, Bosnia, elsewhere in Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo, Haiti, election missions in some of those countries as well as Peru, Nicaragua. I am extreme and I've worked in Congress for Major Owens who was from Brooklyn, New York as his press secretary and foreign policy aide. I'm just very concerned that this is not gonna be placed in the actual context. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing up that very important issue. I think what was revealed in uh, the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer and uh, through events throughout this presidency uh, is that white supremacy and racism and the suppression of blacks and other minorities has been central to a lot of the policies and behavior that we had not quite been able to figure out or solve. And uh, I um, recently, even myself, uh, with respect to what has happened in the mental health field, uh, have realized that white supremacy truly does underlie a lot of the discrepancies that we're seeing and the, the lack of uniform application of the law. Um, we just saw from the Capitol uh, insurrection that um, the response of the Capitol Police itself was uh, just um, unbelievably uh, dis distant from the responses that we've seen with Black Lives Matter protests, uh, peaceful protests. And, um, and so um, that certainly is a matter that should come front and center to our next uh, projects. Uh, we as an organization put out a statement that we believe uh, that white supremacy and racism are a societal mental disorder that needs to be addressed by mental health professionals who are engaged in societal healing. So thank you for bringing up that issue. If anyone else would like to add to this particular topic, uh, I welcome them. Okay, so I'm gonna call on the next person. If folks have something to add on that, perhaps if you can indicate that in the chat so I can, you can get called on uh, quicker. Um, so the next question will come from Janelle. If you can please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So um, I have a question. As, as far as um, healing goes, is there an approach that we can take for, for those who are not fully indoctrinated into the cult, which I understand is going to take some serious deprogramming, but from a change management perspective, getting people to just open their eyes to truth, is, is there some way that something we can say, some kind of keyword, some kind of approach, something that just makes them question if they should consider looking at alternative or alternate sources than the ones that, that they've been following for as long as they've been following them? Yes. Um, uh, is, is there a key word or phrase? I would say um, in your, if you're speaking of personal relations or trying to reach out to uh, individuals, I would say to um, return to your basic humanity because uh, these people um, have not entirely lost their humanity. Um, they have been indoctrinated to believe in certain falsehoods and to resist the truth. 
And so that's very difficult to do from a perspective of trying to persuade. Uh, I do mention in my latest book, Profile of a Nation, Trump's Mind, America's Soul, uh, I try to outline a path for healing where um, the approach is not to try to persuade, but to try to correct the circumstances that have led to the faulty beliefs. Uh, in other words, removing the offending agent, that is um, the, the influential figure with severe symptoms who has been spreading, helping to spread false ideas, uh, his removal itself will be healing to a great degree. Secondly, it is to, um, uh, um, secondly, is it is to change some of the indoctrination uh, conditions, the propaganda and the disinformation presenting itself as news. Uh, many have um, recommended that the FCC bring back the fairness do doctrine. I think uh, some kind of regulation where by um, the media cannot simply run with psychological thought reform uh, would be helpful. And then thirdly, to change the socioeconomic conditions that uh, the conditions of inequality, be it economic or racial or gender, uh, would help a great deal in reducing the psychological injury that makes these individuals predisposed to, to being reformed. Um, in their thoughts. So uh, again, it comes to changing societal conditions and the most expedient, in fact, would be policy uh, that would have widespread effect and in fact, much quicker results than we often imagine. We imagine that prevention would uh, take effect um, much later in time, but um, our experience around the world or uh, what I have experienced through the World Health Organization is that prevention works and it works more rapidly than we imagine. Great, our next question will come from Ann Thacker. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Very much. Um, I um, agree very much with uh, Marian Douglas Ungaro, who was uh, previously um, commenting that, um, you know, the, the core of this, everything that's happened is, is at the core um, racist and, and of white supremacy. And I, I think that um, had people, I do believe that people have been indoctrinated, but I think that at a certain point, they wanted to believe what they were hearing. And I think that a, a good portion of the population um, is using this idea that the election was stolen as an excuse. I, I really don't think that they necessarily are so delusional that they actually believe that. And I will, I will give you an example from my, my town, where my city where I live. I live in South Bend, Indiana, where uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg comes from. Um, he was a presidential candidate. We had uh, have had um, problems for years with uh, racism and white supremacy in our police force. We have a large black population in this city. Um, there was during his last term as mayor, a black man who was shot by a police officer who was known to have made racist remarks in the past. The man was shot um, in a parking lot. The officer did not have his camera on. Um, there was a, a, a trial, he was found, you know, he, he got off and there was a memorial put outside um, in that parking lot for that gentleman who was murdered. And three different times it was vandalized with blue spray paint saying, good shoot. So that was several years ago. Fast forward to two weeks ago, some Black Lives Matter people and a city council member approached the mayor's office and the Fraternal Order of Police because the Fraternal Order of Police had posted on their website a, a bunch of pictures of police officers um, bringing gifts to little children. And in this picture also, they had a picture of a white Santa Claus going like that. 
which if anybody, you know, if you weren't born yesterday, you know that for the last several years, that is a white supremacy symbol. It's been co-opted. So the response to this, and there was an article in today's paper about this, the response to this from the Fraternal Order of Police is that in their view, uh, that is not a white supremacist symbol. And why are these people always criticizing us? You know, you need to start working together with us. And the mayor, who is a democratic mayor, uh, sort of, you know, passed on by Buttigieg, said the same thing, said that, you know, you shouldn't jump to conclusions and believe the worst things about people. So my question for you, and, and also my sincere gratitude, um, Dr. Lee, I've read your, your book and um, I've gained a great, I'm, I'm not a mental health professional, I'm just a concerned citizen. My question for you would be, um, I, I am tempted to approach these people and, you know, I'm an older white woman, I'm attempted to write letters to the editor. I'm attempted. To, I'm tempted to call the mayor's office, but you know, in some senses too, I'm afraid. They they put on their website that the Fraternal Order of Police put on their website the name of the city council member that went to the mayor's office with these concerns, and now she is afraid for her. Afraid something's going to happen to her. So it, it's really a dangerous time. And, you know, I, I will just underscore all of this. They brought a noose and a gallows and the Confederate flag. There is no question what this is about. So how do you prevent racism? How do you prevent or treat people who have thought for hundreds of years, generations upon generations, that this kind of, of um, uh, behavior is okay, and, uh, and and that now we have people, you know, who are supposed to protect us and lead our cities, who are gaslighting and minimizing real open threats to a large portion of the population. And again, thank you, thank you so much for for all your work and your brilliant writing. And um... thank you, thank you for your kind words and for sharing your concerns and. There are definitely um, concerns that have become very apparent to us over these last four years, and especially in the last couple of weeks. Um, I can tell you over the course of my working in jails and prisons over the last couple decades that it had become quite apparent to me that our criminal justice system is not about justice, but in fact, when you are multifold more likely to be incarcerated um, and punished for being black or being poor than you are for committing a crime, then that says something about our culture. When the rules and laws are not applied uniformly, they can be used as a weapon. And in fact, currently they seem to be. Uh, including when laws or uh, even rules of civility are cited to try to uh, make themselves acceptable. Well, um, as, uh, as a mental health professional, the, the method of management with these individuals is in fact limit setting. So we do need law and order just not the way the law and order people say it needs to be applied. Uh, well, uh, we might even analyze that they are projecting uh, the need for themselves onto others uh, who don't really need it. As we have seen with the Black Lives Matter protests, they have, uh, uh, the, even the police forces, the federal forces have used excessive force and injury, not to mention the tear gas and rubber bullets just to have uh, against peaceful protester just to have the, the president have a photo op. Uh, and uh, so they are actually telling us, if we were to psychologically analyze this situation, they are telling us that this is the level of containment they themselves need. And what we're seeing across the board around the country is that more and more of these aggressive, violent individuals are attaining power positions law enforcement positions, uh, lawmaker positions, and even 
up to the presidency. And so instituting some kind of screening, I think, would go a long way to preventing a, a vast majority of all the, the atrocities and calamities that have happened in all societies, in fact. And recently, um, someone from our coalition, in fact, recommended, uh, our coalition consists of international members now, uh, that if our constitution, if the US constitution does not allow for psychological screening, for fitness of candidates, then what about international law? Because um, international law is uh, applies to everyone and, and would be very interested in preventing human rights abuses. In that case, there are mechanisms for the US to adopt international law into its own code. Uh, so that could be another means of, of uh, addressing this problem. Great, okay, our next, next question. question. Our next question will come from Vivian. If you can please unmute your microphone, Vivian, and go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to mention, Ashley, um, Ashley, I, I've spoken to my Congresswoman, her staff, and Ashley, her, the staff member, when I told her all about 45 and what mental health experts were saying and that there should be a fitness for duty exam, she blew it off and said, that's never gonna happen. And I'm, I'm like, oh, okay. But a staffer actually told me that. And in her office, but but first, I wanted to say thanks to all the mental health professionals who bravely spoken out for the past five years. I've learned a lot. It drives me crazy every day that the lawmakers and mainstream media continue not to listen to you guys. That's crazy. I, I mean, I mean, we let a mass we let a mass murderer remain in office instead of immediately containing him. That makes no sense. But my question is. There has to be a way for the Royal Mental Health Coalition, authoritarian experts. I know what well, Ruth Bingiot is a member, right? I think so. Um, fascism yes, the board member. Anti-racism experts like Tim Wise, um, uh, anti-racism activists, cult experts like Stephen Hassan, Robert J. Lifton, and the Poor People's Campaign all work together. The Poor People's Camp Campaign was originally uh, started by Martin Luther King Jr. And that is an intersection. Someone mentioned in the chat about an intersection. And the Poor People's Campaign is an intersection um, uh, uh, against poverty, against systemic racism, climate change, the false moral uh, narrative of, of uh, national uh, Christian national religion. If all of those, is there any way that all of that could come together? I mean, I really, think like Poor People's Campaign and World Mental Health Coalition, but they're weighing everybody. There has to be a way to gang up on the, our lawmakers in mainstream media. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, indeed, our next project is to try to partner with other organizations and uh, also with media organizations. Our structure is such that we have mental health professionals, uh, members have to all be licensed or previously licensed mental health professionals, but our board consists of lawyers, historians, um, political scientists, journalists, uh, other members, and we are actively now looking to branch out and to, um, to become much more a part of uh, uh, everyday um, organization. And uh, we certainly have a lot in common with the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, I certainly have had conversations with Reverend William Barber. And so uh, we look forward to that kind of partnership. Thanks. Great. Our next question will come from uh, Catherine, uh, first letter with a C. If you can please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful meeting. Thank you, Banding. You are the voice in the desert. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate everything you've done. So I, I'm a mental health provider in semi-retirement. I got my master's in 1980, uh, became licensed in the state of Vermont, and New Hampshire, and Arizona, so forth and so on, so and board certified. So there's a couple things I'm thinking about. Um, and I want to address three, three issues that sort of like are in line with what the questions and the comments are so far. Number one, we need to really face where we've come from. I'm so tired of hearing about black slavery. 
when what and it's not because of black people it's because i'm also part black but our this country was founded on greed and genocide and religious bigotry and the people that are called founding fathers are not our founding fathers the bigotry and racism began when the europeans set foot on these shores and created laws to benefit them at my ancestors detriment and you know, people talk about a lot of different things and it always shows me that there was so much ignorance about American Indian history in this nation. We're made up of 800 tribal entities and we didn't get the right to vote until the 1950s. So everybody's running around, oh, women got the right to vote. No, that's not true. So a lot of times we are either ignored or they make slurs like Pocahontas and people don't sit up and say, this is wrong. But I think until we really get educated that slavery began with Native Americans on the plantations mm -hmm. in the South. And they worked then alongside of the people that were brought in here from the continent of Africa, of some of my ancestors came over that way, as well as from the Caribbean islands. So I think that we people need to get smarter about this and really speak to the truth. Because when I bring it up, people get like, oh, I didn't know that. And they get a little bit white people i specifically mean get a little bit not annoyed but they get a little uncomfortable and i think there's those conversations have to happen the second thing is um that as a mental health provider one of the things that, that i found missing within my training and then you know with my colleagues which i see happening today when you ask how do we heal we heal by bringing people together in unity under cosmic consciousness and spirituality, not religion, because religion has been co-opted by white supremacists. And it always has been. Evangelical white Christianity has been dangerous in this country for hundreds of, a couple hundred years, okay? And I think we need to face that because we've got ministers in the churches that are brainwashing people to believe that Trump was like the Messiah returned. And what's happening, I run a couple meetup groups and one meetup group is on, you know, is on, uh, it's called metaphysics. And we need to get into that mindset because there are groups happening around the world that are looking at how do we raise our consciousness? How do we raise our awareness and come together to understand that we're part of this great universe? There's not a you and a me, but I think we have to acknowledge the differences, but also look at how do we think about our brothers and sisters? And I think that within my own career as a clinical social worker, you didn't talk about this stuff. I talked about it with the troops, military, because I treated the military for years. So I think that part of the healing is to create groups in our communities, whether it's through the meetup platform, which is awesome, as I have a lady comes from, from uh, and attends from Italy. So I think that's one way within our own communities, whatever, however, we define community and set up these, these meetings and discuss things in a safe, sacred environment. You have to have something to read, to discuss. So that's what I do. Yes. The other, and we're also looking at the real historical issues around the biblical writings, which were co-opted as well by patriarchs and racism. So that's number two. Number three, um, as a long-term mental health provider, I think that we've been remiss since the law was passed on mental health parity. You remember that? 25 years ago, there was a mental health parity law passed. I think we've been remiss in only being you know, a small group of people that might try to educate the public. Mental health is still laughed at. Mental health treatment is still laughed at. People do not understand what this is about. And um, when I read the article, Bandy, that what Lieberman had done to you, I was, I was just so upset. Uh, because if you remember, not only has the American Psychiatric Association been complicit, but so has the American Psychological Association. And I remember the issue that came up during the war in Iraq when waterboarding was being done. And there was a big, uh, the big uh, annual APA conference was in San Francisco. And they wanted the APA to come out against using psychologists 
to manipulate detainees to get psychological information that the military could use to abuse them and torture them. Do you all remember that? Yes. So at that, at that conference, psychologists got up, they took their membership cards and they threw them at the president of the APA. I think yes. that the mistake, and my NASW has been like out to lunch for a very long time. They've never really um, represented clinical social workers. It's always been uh, administrative or the other kind of social workers. So okay. I forget that organization. But I think that we can't look to our organizations to support us. I think that we have to become um, much more vocal to educate the people. What is mental health? Yes, you know, I agree with you. I'm, I'm sorry to have to. I'm sorry to have oh. to cut you off, but uh, we have a number of questions and limited time. But I thank you for for all that you've mentioned, which is very important, uh, including the fact that religion and nation are often used as ways uh, to cover up. Uh, some of the, the worst impulses uh, human beings try to, try to assert. And um, also our mental health association leaderships uh, have not been uh, responsive necessarily to the membership, have not represented the professionals. Uh, as you were mentioning, the American Psychological Association once colluded with the government to allow for torture. And this time around, the American Psychiatric Association against member protest um, decided to silence the entire profession, not just its members, but illegitimately all mental health pro professionals from the media. And they did it through public campaigns. If it were legitimate, they would have gone through ethics committees. None of that happened. No one was disciplined. And they did it through um, the opposite of what they should have done, uh, which was mental health education and protection of the public. So uh, these are just some egregious examples where the leadership failed us once again and colluded with the leadership of a destructive government rather than fulfill the responsibilities of the profession. Uh, I would like to invite also other coalition members to give their input. Maybe so, uh, there are board members who have joined us this evening. If so, please um, uh, write in the chat so that Leonard could uh, allow your voices to be heard. But we'll go to the next question. Yes, um, so the next question will come from Francis Liu. Uh, please unmute your mic and go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I. In my humble opinion, I think we really need to stay focused on the ongoing danger of Donald Trump in this um, impeachment trial in the Senate um, with uh, thinking about how the coalition can help with a conviction um, rather than an acquittal because his power will increase if he's acquitted um, as compared to if he is convicted. And very concretely, uh, one a possibility would be he would be barred from running for office by a simple majority vote after the conviction. You have to have the conviction by two thirds. Then you have a separate vote for running again for federal office. So I, I think we need to try to do everything we can to get a conviction and then a vote that he can't run again. And that will help lessen the danger that he will pose. And I think that's the urgent matter at hand. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I myself and a number of our coalition members and uh, authors of The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump have put out articles and statements saying that prosecution and uh, severe limit setting is the, the means of treatment for these individuals and containment so that the rest of the society could be safe. And I absolutely agree with you in that um, conviction is the minimum that would be required for containing Donald Trump's continued influence. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next question. Our next question will come from Michael Ross. Please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Bandy, for, for hosting this. I was very moved by watching uh, Representative Raskins' his interview again. That was uh, heartbreaking. 
uh, and Ann Thacker, yes, these are dangerous times indeed. Bandy, can you, I have two questions. One is, could you possibly provide a little update on the New York Times ad and what's going on there? And would the Washington Post be a little bit cheaper and so forth? Um, but principally in these town halls, we've been talking extensively and over and over again about making a psychiatric evaluation and screening as a pre prerequisite to uh, running or holding public office. Uh, and you just mentioned tonight that there might be a constitutional impediment to this. So my main question is, what can we do? Uh, what is it going to take? Uh, do we have to denounce this so-called Goldwater rule, which really doesn't exist in a legal framework? Um, can we enroll Representative Raskin to introduce a constitutional amendment to allow something like this to happen, this, this uh, prerequisite to, to holding office? Um, is that to be done in the context of this Truth and Reconciliation Co Commission? Uh, how do we bring this awareness to the American public that there's something very, very wrong with the system right now? Um, Vivian, yes, Stephen Hassan needs to be involved. Uh, his, his, the cult of Trump book is seminal. Uh, can he be called as a witness to the impeachment trial? As could you, Dr. Lee. Uh, can Representative Raskins bring you in to that procedure? Uh, seriously, where are we going from here? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, these are all reasonable recommendations. We have repeatedly tried to get Congress to uh, be um, make it simply more acceptable and open to have mental health experts testify. But for some reason, uh, we have just been an, uh, an area not to be brought up and not to be touched. Uh, unfortunately, I think the speaker has had a great role in that because for a while we had, especially early in the presidency, we had um, just an outpouring of Congress members uh, being truly interested in having us testify in Congress. And um, so what could be needed? Uh, certainly strengthening the 25th Amendment. Uh, they say through legislation, because revising it would be complicated. We already have legislation that uh, Representative Raskin had uh, introduced uh, several times, in fact, and uh, creating another body that would replace the cabinet and a body that includes experts would make the process natural. Um, another uh, uh, proposal people have made is actually to amend our constitution. Uh, it used to be that there were pretty frequent amendments and updatings of the constitution. So this would be a very reasonable evolution with change of the times and increase in um, and development of science and development of psychological sciences. Certainly uh, political bodies and uh, propaganda networks are making use of psychological expertise. That's what goes into marketing and thought reform in ways that are harmful to the public. Why can't we include it in a way that would be helpful to the public? So um, just the last point about a New York Times ad. Yes, we're trying to shape the content of it. We raised $9,000 by over a hundred uh, contributors. Uh, that counts for about a half of a quarter page ad. So we'd like to be able to raise the rest and to propose our next stage at the opportune moment. Great, our next question will come from Stephanie Jones. Uh, please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hi, Bandy. Hi, all. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, first, I want to wish you all uh, health, good health for you and yours. I hope everybody's safe. Uh, Bandy, I want to thank you for everything. Um, I am a psychologist. I'm an, uh, an adjunct associate professor at Columbia University Teachers College. I'm a, I write on a heroic rescue during the Holocaust on rescuers and bystanderism. Um, and about four years ago, I put forth some proposals to try to uh, heal the fragmented divide uh, among the nation based on um, a lot of Irvin Staub's work on um, repair of genocide. 
And um, basically our, our greatest asset right now is Joe Biden, um, because as we know, the, uh, the most salient uh, factor in healing trauma is empathy. And we have a man who is, has a grounded moral compass as our leader right now, and Irvin Staub um, writes that uh, people will adhere um, and conform uh, to messages of good as readily as they will to messages of evil. Uh, so uh, somebody had proposed that Biden um, put forth a trauma czar, which I think is a great idea, actually, because I think we have a, a mass trauma here. Um, and the trauma czar can oversee a group of professionals um, to begin to train based on graduated tiers going into, um, into communities uh, to train people um, to listen. Uh, because listening is the key to conflict resolution, reconciliation, and repair. Um, as, was it, as with in-group ideology grows more entrenched and aggressive, uh, both sides resist outreaching beyond our respective bubbles. Many angry liberals express disdain for, disdain for ignorant rednecks, just as the alt-right denigrates liberals as libtards. We have not yet learned how to raise our voices without raising our voices. And more importantly, we've stopped listening to each other. I believe that Americans on both sides of the national political divide are experiencing a polarizing dread of mass identity theft that threatens to undermine democracy itself. Um, okay. But I believe that um, the right-wing media machine inflames white nationalism, preys upon conservative spheres of the other, deepens the divide and manipulates a mass of ordinary good people into buying into the illusion of a need to protect against alien invasion by non-whites. Of course, no leader can protect America by dividing it. The process of reintegration requires the reestablishment of basic safety and basic trust within which testimony can be voiced, validated, and witnessed. Hence, this crisis of mass identity fragmentation requires the leadership of skilled psychologists who can organize and train a team of volunteer civilians to scale the empathy wall, as Arlie Hochschild puts it, and offer radical empathic listening to the other side. Thank you. Thank you very much for those important points. And uh, I'm delighted to hear that you studied bystanderism. Um, Irvin Staub was a very dear colleague of mine when I was at Harvard. And um, so uh, I think that uh, uh, people who don't know his work, he, uh, I think a lot of it is relevant to what we are going through now. And I absolutely agree with you that mental health professionals need to be uh, cent central in trying to heal the divide. Because if we look at uh, a nation just as an individual, we can tell the signs of poor health through fragmentation. So uh, wholeness indicates health and we already see conflict and fragmentation occur when there's a general decline in state of health. Uh, right and left all included in the whole. So um, uh, just to clarify, we our next stages are not connected in particular to the Biden administration. We have chosen to remain independent so that we can go the farthest possible and uh, expand as much as we would like in areas of need and be available as consultants. So that is uh, our general approach. So now that we're uh, almost out of time, I'd like to get three questions at once. Leonard, if you could collect them first and then I'll try to answer. Okay, our first one will come from Martha Jane Adams. Um, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Thank you, Leonard. Um, thank you, Bandy, so much. Uh, I will be succinct as I can be. I too am a, I've, I've been a journalist in Ohio for over 30 years. And um, we have seen dramatically two parts of the uh, problems of um, extremism in, in Ohio. One, I greatly support the effort on the behalf of the coalition to figure out how to perhaps at will a fitness test for it's much easier to get somebody 
uh, before they're elected um, than after they're elected. So um, there, and there needs to be something. We, already they're generally offer their health, not always, but um, a health assessment. It, frankly, it shouldn't come from their own personal physician. It should come from someone who's independent, but that's another issue. I just wanted to affirm that. The other issue in extremism, especially in Ohio and probably in other places as well, because it's a Republican tactic across the country, it is gerrymandering. And this increases the polarization of the populations. Uh, we've seen it in Ohio. It is very destructive here. And uh, so I would hope the coalition would unite in support or offer it their um, uh, willingness to be advisors or um, discuss with um, people who are going to be uh, taking a position about how the uh, districts in, in our state and other states are being divided, that it should be more equal, and, um, and that would help a lot. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Great. The next question will come from Gary. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Thank you. Good evening. Um, yeah, I just want to talk about very briefly approaching this from going to a, from a national to the local level. <clears throat> so talking to local elected officials, we have one in my district, Lou Korea, who's um, was hiding in the Capitol and uh, is currently under quarantine. Uh, I haven't gotten an answer yet as to whether he's interested in looking at the World Mental Health Organization, but maybe instead of going so nationally that we could also go locally. Thanks. Thank you. Great, and then the last one will come from Judith Lipton. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Hi, um, thank you very much. And thank you so much, Bandy, for everything you've done. Um, I guess my question is a good one, maybe for a wrap up. I looked at the website for the World Mental Health Coalition and I'm still not clear on two things. One is, is it possible that Trump could be charged under international law, something like the Nuremberg trials for crimes against humanity, particularly given um, his genocidal approach to COVID or avoidance of COVID. Um, I don't know how the Nuremberg um, trials were set up or who charged Eichmann and people like that. But I, I, I would like to know if he could be pardoned under US law, could he still be guilty under international law? And second question I have is, could you clarify please, um, who are we? Who are the World Mental Health Coalition? Who are the members? Who are the leaders? What levels of involvement are you looking for? People to join, people to donate, people to spend um, band committees? Um, is there an organ organizational structure that you could send out and make requests of how can we help you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'll try to answer the three questions. First of all, the two parts that lead to extremism, lack of fitness testing and gerrymandering. Um, we hope to serve as uh, a societal advisory council. Uh, what we lack as a society is uh, the kinds of independent, professional-based, uh, in intellectual-based advisory councils that other many other governments have. We um, intellectuals and professionals tend to be only invited when the politicians deem it to be fit and then they recommend uh, or they ask for uh, us to answer very limited questions that they could either um, 
use or not use to their advantage. So that's very different from uh, starting policy based on societal need, uh, on, based on evidence. And these are the kinds of structural changes I think need to happen. And uh, that's something that, that we might wish to think about. Um, and uh, the next question about whether uh, to act locally as well as nationally, certainly we are, uh, we actually were conceiving of starting our Truth and Reconciliation Commission in a more open and approachable way uh, happening simultaneously around the country by soliciting the everyday person's um, uh, testimony as to what, uh, what has injured them over these four years and, and uh, their proposals as to how um, the nation could heal. So we're still thinking about those things. I think bringing the truth out is important. And sometimes that's at the very local and personal level as well. Uh, the third uh, comment about international law, how do we bring Nuremberg trials uh, to be um, the Nuremberg trials are often called victor trials in that um, the victors forced it on the nation. It wasn't Germany running them. Uh, but we also have the example of the TRC in South Africa, where um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu made the proposal and the framing that uh, became authoritative enough for the nation to take it on uh, or not be able to resist uh, having such a forum. So um, uh, certainly uh, I agree that uh, this president has caused international calamity with the lack of COVID-19 response. Uh, the US being the epicenter, no doubt we have helped spread it, uh, perhaps even made it into a pandemic rather than a con contained epidemic that having all the structures we he dismantled would have uh, helped to do. And in addition, while we didn't have a cure, he is said to be um, the upwards of 40% of misinformation, the source of misinformation about COVID-19 around the world. And many countries are now copying him. So uh, certainly his influence has been devastating, not just to our country, but to others. Who are the members of WMHC? Um, they are from around the world. We only check their licenses uh, the, to check that they had have or have had a valid license and that they aren't flagged to us for being uh, on the Trump side and uh, trying to infiltrate or, or for one reason or another. Uh, but otherwise we have accepted everybody. Uh, as long as they're mental health professionals. Uh, we have a board, as I mentioned, that is more like a think tank. And we do have a leadership structure. We've been keeping the board member names secret because many of them are high profile, uh, but we have held a couple events uh, most recently, the ho holiday party where board members got to meet the members. Um, but with the transition of administration, we hope to have uh, a more open uh, listing of the members and also to have, uh, uh, to have the, the, a bit more leisure to have a structured, uh, structured setting where people know exactly where to go and what to do. Um, I think I would like to take uh, a couple more questions since there are a lot remaining. Meanwhile, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat and we will try to answer them and post them on our website. Uh, but uh, we'll try to answer just a couple more, Leonard, if you can. Okay. Great, um, next one will come from Leslie Wagner. Please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hi there. I just wanted to introduce myself as Bandy had suggested. I'm one of the board members of the World Mental Health Coalition, and I wanted to let you know how much we appreciate all your participation. Um, we are working especially hard. Um, Bandy has all along to try and get the uh, fitness for duty test to resemble those that are required of the people who have access to nuclear weapons before 
before someone takes office. And we have a great passion and I have a great passion for the uh, reconciliation forum. Uh, while right now we're addressing the emergency uh, with all our energy um, of the danger that President Trump presents. As we look forward, we're looking to promote sound, sane leadership and sanity in our own country by having dialogues in the community, not unlike those that I helped uh, lead in Los Angeles after the Rodney King riots, and uh, not unlike that, those that were held in South Africa. So thank you uh, for being here. Thank you, Leslie, for that input. Great, um, the next one will come from Joe uh, Shippa. If you can please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. I've, I've been reading your material and following you uh, all the way through this. Uh, you already answered part of the question about what the mental health coalition is, and I, um, I have signed up. Uh, I, I am a clinical and school psychologist as well as a uh, school district administrator supervising clinical services uh, in Westchester County in New York. Uh, I guess I am concerned about um, maybe getting to the place of what we can do moving forward, because my, my thoughts about, I know that we all have an idea about, you know, really taking care of the situation with, uh, with Donald Trump, but my fear is that going in that door and using him, of course, we, we have the example of him, but going in that door uh, too forcefully will not give us a, uh, a seat at the table to be talking about mental health in general and how important it is. Um, so I wondered if there is a, a, a way, a path forward that you see that we will be taking on and how, uh, and again, how we can join you in that path in this, in, in what I consider a very worthy and very necessary course right now. Okay, thank you. Leonard, we can take one more question, please. Okay, um, the Zoom username Poppy, if you can please unmute your mic and ask your question, thank you. Hi, thanks for taking my question, Dr. Lee. I've been following along since about 2014, 2015, as we all probably have been. I'm not a mental health professional. I am a biological scientist and have been interested in neurology and uh, psychology for a long time. Um, I'm asking kind of as a lay person who recently got out of a, a, a relationship with a malignant narcissist, literally right, maybe a year before, um, Trump was started to uh, uh, campaign and it took me a good six months, almost a year of obsessing to try to figure out what this was. And when I started to read a lot more about it and I read your book, it, it felt like there's definitely a blueprint for that personality. And the more I learn about it and, and realize that it is a character disorder that really can't be treated, um, how how can how can we help? I mean, as me as a layperson, not as a psychologist, um, help uh, educate people about the fact that this kind of person exists because it seems on some level almost like a like a subhuman. If if a conscience and empathy is what makes you a human being, how, how do you? It's just shocking and difficult to accept, and then watch it watch it play out like we all have over the last you know, four years. And, and pretty much if we know what we're talking about, we, we, we knew what was coming and how it might end. Um, so if you could just yeah. share a little bit with that, would be great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask, answer your question first. Uh, oftentimes, um, members of the public, the lay persons, without having experience, uh, that meant without having the experience that mental health professionals do with pathological personalities, um, pathology in general it tends to be quite different than expected and beyond our imagination. And especially when you come across a malignant narcissist or a sociopath, it, uh, it's almost like your soul is taken out. You, your trust in humanity is violated. And uh, so um, 
I, I think one of the projects we have is just to somehow work through the, the denial and resistance in our culture to even want to think about mental health issues. And we know from our mental health experience that the poorer the state of mental health, the more one will resist even thinking about mental health or the possibility of disorder. So we have to catch it in the culture soon. We can't wait for the administration to respond. It's too slow. Even the Biden administration has not responded the way one would. Uh, he's responded admirably uh, already to uh, with his promises plans for the COVID-19 crisis, but he has not nearly addressed the mental health issue arising just from that, let alone from the Trump presidency. And uh, oftentimes we find that politicians are quite um, um, not uh, distant from being psychologically minded. And so uh, there's a lot of education to do, uh, perhaps even intervention to start with, uh, in terms of trying to influence some policies that may not be obviously mental health related, but do affect a population's mental health. So I think our focus is gonna remain solidly on societal mental health. This is something that is just not addressed anywhere else. Um, so uh, uh, to answer the question about membership, how can one navigate uh, membership uh, to, to actually coming to do things? Well, for, for now, uh, we have kept a very informal structure. If you are part of the membership, you would get occasional newsletters, but to be more reliably in touch, um, please join our listserv, then you will get emails on a daily basis. And uh, another way is to join a committee. We have several committees that are happening with projects. You can head, you can offer to head a committee uh, or join existing committees. And, um, and we uh, will try to be more organized uh, when things let up a little. So, uh, so that we're, we're working on. So we're out of time. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and, and for being with us through this transition. Um, be safe and well through the rest of the remaining hours, now a little less than 64. Uh, um, and thank you for all your support through these years and into the future. Good night.